Philippians chapter 4. Beginning with verse number 10. And I'm, I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to scatter a few remarks today. I'll give you the skeleton and let you fill in the flesh when you get home. Because we have revival tonight. And, and I want you to be ready. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 10. I'll read through verse 13. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty, and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want to uh, strive to close this series, our moving forward series today with this thought, I won't complain. I won't complain.
Look at somebody and tell them I could complain, but I won't. He's been good to me. Amen. Be seated if you can. Excuse me, but I'm shouting over what I didn't think I'd make it through. And I'm still not completely through it. But since I'm here, I might as well give them glory like it's already done. I, I'm going to shout like I've already got the victory. I'm I'm going to praise them like it's already worked out. And even though tears may be falling, I've still got my joy. I, I've still got my mind. I, and he's still worthy. Bless your name. Y'all didn't want to wait till tonight. But you don't have to wait. You don't have to wait till seven o'clock. Let's give them glory right now. Let, let's give them praise right now. Hey! Philippians 4. <laughs> Y'all be seated. Be seated. of Philippians the Apostle Paul is writing from prison Paul is somebody who knows firsthand what it means to suffer 
If you want to talk about suffering and struggle and strain, Paul is a first-hand witness to suffering, strain, and struggle. Shipwrecked, Paul can talk about it. Losing friends, Paul can talk about it. Making new enemies, Paul can talk about it. Being misunderstood, Paul can talk about it. Having to give up the right for the wrong, Paul. Paul knew all about it. And if there was ever anybody who had justification for complaint, it was Paul. And yet, as we read Philippians, we can glean from the maturity that has happened within Paul. I've learned that no matter how smart you are, no matter how wise you believe you are, there are just some things that you have to live through in order to fully understand and appreciate. There are some things people can tell you, but then there are other things that you just have to go through for yourself. Nobody can tell Paul about being snake bitten. He knew all about it. To have, to to have a claim and, and status on one hand and then on the other hand to completely lose it to where the status you have doesn't even matter. Life is strange like that. One day you can be on top of the world. And then the very next day, the world can be on top of you. That's why you and I ought not put stock into meaningless things. Paul no longer puts weight or credence in the fact that he is one who has dual citizenship or that he's of the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee of Pharisees, a protege of Gamaliel. He doesn't put stock in this. In fact, he says, all of this I count it but dung. Because at the end of the day, I just want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering and in the power of his resurrection. Paul, with a grateful heart, writes to the church at Philippi. And as he closes this letter in chapter 4, in a very pastoral way, he deals specifically with some of the challenges that they are facing in Philippi. He says, there are two sisters there who I love very much who struggled with me in the gospel, and, and they can't seem to get along. I'm hearing there's some cattiness and and some unnecessary competition. I need y'all to work that out. I know that there have never been arguments in the church before. But here in Philippi, there was an argument. And Paul challenges them to be of the same mind, to be unified. To rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. It is so strange to me that while Paul has personal sorrow in his life, he spends the entirety of the Philippian letter talking about joy. From prison, a place of peril and punishment, 
Paul still talks about joy. And then he says to them, the Lord is near. Don't, don't worry about anything. But in prayer and supplication, make your supplication known with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And then here's, he says this, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And as he addresses the pettiness that is pervasive in the Philippian congregation, he elevates their consciousness, or at least aspires to, when he says, and finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Paul and so many words as I need y'all to get along. Got to get your minds right. If you're going to survive and if you're going to be who God is truly calling you to be, you have to be people of peace. You have to be of one mind and you have to set your mind on things that are above. Says, the God of peace will be with you. Paul, no less than three times, in this final chapter, talks about the peace of God. Some of us become frustrated with God because we think that peace comes when everything is okay. If, if, I, if I could just get him to do right, I could have some peace. If I could just get her to turn the stove on just three times a week. I'm tired of door dashing, I could have some peace. And peace is not unlike joy. In the sense that peace is not predicated on what you're going through in your life. The source of your peace does not come from what someone else says or does. But real peace, God's peace, God's peace can show up when life is lifing and when people are peopling. Scripture is replete with examples of just how peace can show up in somebody's life. You do well to remember that on the Sea of Galilee, a storm, a violent storm was raging. The tempest was raging. The billows were tossing high. Jesus was asleep on the ship. And it was threatening to capsize. And as the winds were blowing and the rain was falling and the waves were billowing in fr a frantic terror, the disciples disrupt Jesus' nap and says, Master, carest thou not that we perish. Can I give you the Vickers Revised Standard Version? Jesus, do you care if we live or die? How can you sleep at a time like this? 
and in the middle of the storm, and Jesus gets up and says, peace, be still. Many of you are upset with God because you feel as if you could have peace if the storm would just stop. God is saying to you, you can have peace if you stop the storm. Peace does not come from the exterior circumstances of your life, but God's peace comes from within when you know that you serve the Prince of Peace who says, my peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you, not as the world gives. I'll give you a peace, Paul says, that surpasses all understanding. You won't even be able to make sense of it while other folks are pulling their hair out. You can smile. It doesn't mean that the storm isn't raging. It just means that in the middle of the storm, you know that your anchor holds. Shout at somebody and tell them, I got peace. I got peace. I got peace. And in reflection of this journey, when Paul looks back over his life and pours out this pastoral wisdom to the Philippian church, he talks as a man with sage wisdom. He speaks as if somebody who has been through something and survived something and ought to have about 10 or 12 folk in the son's house who can shout and testify that the reason why I can keep going is because when I look back over my life and think about all the things that God has brought me through, I've learned not to give up on God in a storm because he's faithful to bring me peace. So Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord. I, I, I'm at a settled place now where, where I, I'm at the point where I don't allow things and people to move me. You can say what you want. You can try to do what you want. But peace is such a liberating feeling. When you know who you are and whose you are, when you know who your creator is, when you know that God is the only one who can speak and give you life and can speak and you lay down and go to sleep, when you know the source of your peace is God, you don't allow things to move you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly, Paul says, that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Paul is excited because the Philippian church had a history of financially supporting his missionary journeys. That Paul knew, even though he didn't depend on it, he could count on having some folks in Philippi who would help him take the gospel forward. And our brothers and sisters, it's a good thing to live this life knowing that you got some people behind you to push you. It's, it's a great feeling to know that God thinks enough of you that he will give you some folk who will say you can do it, you can make it, you can withstand it, you can can survive it and not only am I pushing for you and praying for you but I'm walking with you to make sure that you become what God wants you to be Paul has a history with the Philippian church they are known to be generous people and there's been quite some time since the Philippian church was able to do what they wanted to do because Epaphroditus had been sick. Their messenger, their apostle had been sick, but now God has restored him, and now Paul wants to send him back, and now the Philippian church is resuming the ministry that has helped them to become beloved to Paul. He says, you have revived your concern for me. You were concerned for me, but didn't have an opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need. I, I'm not excited because I need something. I'm not calling on you and saying I love you because I'm trying to butter you up because I need something from you. 
Paul says, I'm just truly expressing my gratitude. He says, because I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. In fact, Paul calls the record. I know what it is to have little. And I know what it is to have plenty. I know what it is to make a wish sandwich. And I know what it is to be able to go to Houston's any day of the week and order the Hawaiian medium well with mashed potatoes and Brussels sprouts on the side with a little extra butter and a nice glass of Moscato. I know what it is. I know what it is to have little. And I know what it is to have plenty. I, I know that when I have little, God is still God and God is still good. And I know that when I have much, God is still God and God is still good. In all things, I've learned how to be content. I've learned how to make the most of whatever situation I'm in. And all brothers and sisters, you will know that you are living in the peace of God where if you don't have enough money or you got more than what you need, you can still stand and say, God, I bless your name. God, you are worthy to be praised. God, I give you glory and honor just for who you are. I know what it is to have little and I know what it is to have much. In any and all circumstances, Paul says, I've learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I'm not talking to you because I need you to make a way for me. Like Paul, Paul was not the begging kind of preacher. Paul was the kind of preacher that had multiple streams of income. Paul did not depend on revival honorariums to get himself through. But when push came to shove, Paul had a trade that he could lean on. If he didn't have money coming from the churches, if he didn't have ways that were being made through that avenue, Paul knew how to roll up his sleeves and start building tents for the athletic initiatives because Paul knew how to make some money. Paul would get done whatever it needed to do, whatever he needed to do. Paul knew how to make make a way out of no way for his financial situation. Paul says, I know what it is to have little. I, I don't beg anybody for anything. If I got to make the way, I'll make the way. If I got to depend on me, I'll depend on me. I'm not writing to you because I need you to make me more comfortable. I just want you to know that I'm grateful for who you are and for how God has stirred your heart to be a blessing to me. Is there anybody here who can just lift up holy hands and say, I don't bother nobody because I need something but I just reach out and ask how you doing because I want you to know that I'm encouraging you and, and that I'm concerned for you and, and the peace that I have on the inside comes from knowing that I belong to God Paul says I, I, I'm not begging for anything I, I've learned how to navigate the ebbs and flows of life I, I love Paul's transparency here because sometimes we have a way of convincing ourselves that if we are anointed, then that means that we can circumvent problems. That if we know how to pray and call on the name of the Lord, then somehow we can manipulate God into allowing us to take the I-285 around problems and hardships and difficulties. But Paul writes and says, oh no, I'm not exempt from the vicissitudes of life. That's a good church word. I'm not exempt from the problems of the world. I know that the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. I know that man born of woman is a 
of a few days and those few days are full of trouble I know that in this world we shall have trials and tribulations but I have learned not to allow what happens to me to define how I view myself and how I view the faithfulness of God if the sun is shining God is faithful if it's raining God is faithful if I'm in the valley God is faithful if I'm on the mountain God is faithful if I got a full Rolodex God is faithful if my friends are few God is faithful and I'm done and then Paul says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me one of the most misquoted verses one of the greatest verses consistently taken out of context because when you well when some of your cousins say Philippians 4 13 I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in their minds they've convinced themselves that whatever idea they come up with that God will then sanction it and make it come to pass but that's not what Paul is saying in Philippians 4 13 when Paul says to the Philippian church that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me Paul is talking about because I have the peace of God because I have a relationship with God no matter what life throws my way I know that I can endure the hardship because the power that I have, the strength that I have, the resolve that I have, the determination that I have does not come from the friends that I can call. And it does not come because life has always been easy. But when Paul says I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, Paul is saying that no matter what comes my way, I got somebody who gives me strength where I'm weak. I got somebody who builds me up when I'm torn down. I got somebody who's able to feed me when I'm hungry. I got somebody who's able to clothe me when I'm naked. I can survive it. I can endure it. I can withstand it because I've got Jesus on my side. Good evening, church. May the Lord bless you real good. I'll see you tonight at 7 o'clock. But I've just come to let somebody know that we're getting ready to move forward. We're moving forward as a church family. We're rolling with the right people. Is there anybody here when you look back over your life you can testify that I've had some difficulties I've had some hardships I've had some rough times but I made up in my mind I won't complain because when I think about how he keeps on keeping me when I think about him how he keeps on providing when I think about how he keeps on making a way I gotta be content whether I'm up or whether I'm down even if I'm almost level to the ground I have learned how to be content I've got a smile on my face not because everything is easy but because on the inside I've got the peace of God that surpasses all understanding when you leave here today leave here knowing that you can do all things through Christ that strengthens you what do you mean all things I can keep on living I can keep on serving I can keep on preaching I can keep on believing all things I can keep on loving all things I can keep on trusting all things I can keep on shouting 
even when my heart is broken all things why don't you look at somebody and tell your neighbor neighbor I won't complain because God is getting ready to give me power to endure to withstand to overcome to conquer find somebody that looks like they came to have church and tell your neighbor neighbor I won't complain I've had some good days I've had some hills to climb I've had some weary days and some sleepless nights but when when I when I look around and I think things over all of my good days outweigh my bad days I still got some bad days but I I won't I won't I won't I won't I won't complain yeah 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 Doors of the church are open. You know, we messed a lot of people up in church because we tried to convince people that if you just give your life to Jesus Christ, everything will be all right. And eventually it will. That's not always immediate. But can I tell you something that I've learned? What God does not do immediately, he reserves the right to do suddenly. And if God doesn't do, do it immediately, and even if he doesn't perform it suddenly, he has the power to do it eventually. If you're here today, I want to give you some real talk. Giving your life to Jesus Christ does not mean that all of your problems will go away. In fact, if I can be honest, sometimes choosing Jesus Christ means that you'll have more problems more enemies more haters more discouragers more naysayers giving your life to Christ doesn't take your problems away but can I tell you what it does give you it gives you somebody who will walk with you every step of the way who will never leave you there's no mistake that you can make that is so bad that he'll turn his back on you friends may leave you but in Jesus Christ you got a friend who will go with you to the end and that's what gives you peace huh. 
The market may crash, but my relationship with Christ has never crashed. Your house may go into foreclosure, but your relationship with God will never go into foreclosure. What can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? There is nothing. Nothing. If you're here today and you want that peace that can only come from God, that will help you choose contentment instead of complaining, you can be saved today if you're here wherever you are main floor balcony son's house online we invite you into relationship with jesus christ today if you're here you want to be saved you want to give your life to jesus christ as a candidate for baptism if you're here just come on if that's you Today is the day of salvation. Harden not your heart. Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you're here and that's you, just come on. Maybe you're here today. And you're saying, Pastor, I'm saved. I'm in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. I have that wonderful gift of God's peace. I've learned how to be content but maybe you're here today and you don't have a church home you don't have a house of spiritual covering connect to a place where you can work out your soul salvation in fear and trembling can I tell you let me be honest we are not a perfect church we are not we are gathering of imperfect people who serve a perfect God but can I tell you you are looking at one of the world's greatest hospitals right here at Fairfield Baptist Church all of us are sick with something but we know a healer sometimes we come to this moment and we tell ourselves I I'm waiting because I'm looking for the perfect church can I save you some time there is no perfect church but if by chance if by chance you stumble upon the perfect church you find the perfect church can you do us all a favor don't you join it come on I see you sister don't join it the moment you find the perfect church and you join it it ain't perfect no more if you're here today, we're waiting on you. Just come on, come on. Wherever you are, main floor, balcony, come on. There will be peace. If you're here, this is your day. This is your moment. This is your time. 